morning. Welcome to the genealogy program on behalf of the Royal Gorge Regional Museum and History Center. So today we have a very interesting and what can be challenging topic, adoption. So Terry's going to tell us all about that and give us some tips on doing adoption research. Thank you, Terry. So Good morning. Um, as Jessica said, sometimes this is a very difficult topic to research, number one, and also for the protection of the various family members. It may uh, provide some um, uncomfortable moments, but we're going to dive in this morning. Um, unfortunately, I think we're going to have a little bit more history than the how-tos, but hopefully we can give you some clues on how to find some of these legal records. If by any chance you're having any trouble um, getting in, you can contact us at this number and we'll dive right in. The first thing we want to look at is um, a couple of definitions. Um, one of the first things is illegitimacy. And we think of the common definition that the parents were not married when the child was born. But there are also some um, influences on this definition that concern, that concern the state versus the church. Civil marriage is not recognized by the church. So if a couple is only married um, by, by the state, their child may be considered illegitimate in the eyes of the church. And by the same token, vice versa, a church marriage is not recognized by the state. Um, so there are potentially some complications when thinking about illegitimacy. One of the interesting little facts that I saw was early on in England, if a mar man married his deceased wife's sister, the marriage was not considered valid, and the children in that case were also illegitimate. And when you think about um, the early colonial times when we were British subjects, this um, uh, law uh, still applied. So one of the most important um, considerations when talking about illegitimacy is that the child has no legal standing in the family. So in terms of inheritance or um, schooling or other things, the child is not a legal member of the family. There are several records that we can look at and see um, that illegitimate children um, have been uh, registered either in the church or with the state. And in a lot of parish or uh, church records, you might see the term base born or a natural child, and some of them outright call the child a bastard. Um, there might be some shameful facts recorded um, around the relationship of the parents, the mother and the father. And there are two definitions that um, sometimes crop up um, in the records that will help us to identify, um, in some cases, the father. If the record says that um, the father is reputed, it means that he is admitting that he has fathered the child. If a record indicates that um, the father's name is imputed, it means that he has not admitted it and the mother is accusing the man. One of the other things to look at is the relationship within the family. Is the child the youngest child in the family? Is there a significant difference um, between the uh, previous youngest child versus the new youngest child? Or is this person the oldest grandchild? And we'll be talking about some of the societal um, influences that governed this question. 
We also need to look at the social attitudes surrounding um, illegitimacy. Uh, they depended on the time, the country, the religion, and most of all, money. And what was the social status of the people concerned um, in the records? As far as the church was concerned, uh, illegitimacy was a sin. It was a shameful event. As far as the state was concerned, they just wanted to know who was going to pay for the upbringing of this child or for the care of this child's mother. There was not as much of a stigma against adoption or illegitimacy until the Victorian era and the beginning of the 20th century here in the United States. We've looked at the state and asked the question, who's going to pay? In many cases, early on, it was resolved within the family or via local authorities. Women might have been brought into court and requested to name the father because they wanted to obtain the money to pay the support for the child. And with that, we see the development of bastardy bonds. And these were documented and do survive in both the church and in county records. For the most part here in the United States, the bastardy bonds were along the Southern Atlantic coast from North Carolina down through Georgia, but you might find them elsewhere as well. Here is one um, from Barty County, North Carolina. And the first paragraph just um, has a lot of legalese. Who are the men that are the court appointed officials and they are bound um, by this um, order to ensure that the sum of I'm just trying to see where it is. Um, they are there. The father is going to um, pay 300 pounds um, to the justices. And these three people are bound um, by this legislation. It is the 26th day of June in the year 1795. And I'm going to read the condition, the above obligation is such that whereas the above bounded Samuel Myers stands charged according to the law with being the deputed father of a bastard child of which Susanna Hayes is the now, is now with child. So the child is unborn, but Samuel Myers is um, going to be forced to pay 300 pounds a year for the maintenance of that child. We also have a bastardy bond from Forsyth County, Georgia. And in this case, we, Ellen Jones as principal, and George Bennett as security, both of said county, acknowledge ourselves held and bound to Alexander Johnson and a series of other gentlemen of the court, justices of the, the inferior court and their successors in the office in the sum of 150 pounds. And there is the conversion of the pounds to dollars and cents. What is unusual about this bond is that Ellen is a single woman. Um, she has made an oath before the court. And on March 4th of 1863, she has delivered a female child, which child is a bastard. What is unusual about this um, particular case is that she, a single woman, a single white woman, 
is accepting the financial responsibility for her own child. With the advent of industrialization, we find people um, moving to the cities, especially um, young men and young women. And because of that, illegitimacy has soared. We have the establishment of foundling homes, workhouses, almshouses, and poorhouses. And with those, the responsibility of raising the child is shifting from the mother to these institutions. The poor houses, alms houses, and in some cases, the work houses, were deemed to be a negative influence upon the young children. So by the 1870s, late in the 1870s, um, there were laws forbidding children from being sent to the poor houses and also commanding that any children that are, have been in the poor houses be released. Here is a picture of the New York Foundling Home and we'll talk a little bit about it um, in a couple of minutes. And we also see the Dexter Asylum in Rhode Island. These are huge buildings. So the problem with abandoned children is large and significant. I also want to point out that while the term asylum has a negative um, connotation nowadays, um, back when these um, institutions were originally set up, an asylum was a place of protection. Um, it offered protection to the individuals, whether they be children or the unwed mother. So don't impute a, a negative um, connotation to it. The other thing to look at besides illegitimacy is orphans. An orphan is a child who has lost either one or both of their parents whether it's through abandonment, um, death, illness, or for some families, some form of financial difficulty. And most importantly, in a lot of these records, it's important to note that children that might be in the orphanage might not be orphans at all. They may still have both living parents or one living parent. I was surprised to find that the first documented orphanage opened in New Orleans as early as 1727, um, which to me was very, very early on. Um, in that period of industrialization between the 1790s and the 1850s, we have already said how illegitimacy soared, so the numbers of children that were in these institutions also rose significantly. During this same time frame, 56 orphan asylums had opened throughout the United States and virtually every major city or major religious denomination had established orphanages. Here's one of those religious or organizations. It's as late as 1906, but we have the Hebrew Orphan Asylum in Brooklyn, New York. And in New England, we have the Home for Little Wanderers, which I think is a humorous name for a dire situation. There are two very important dates associated with adoption legislation. Prior to 1851, adoption was not a part of the legal system. It was not recognized legally. Judges did not have any authority to cut the ties of the biological family. What wound up happening was that 
it was akin to the fostering system. Children might have been placed with other members of the family, um, aunts, uncles, grandparents, or they might have been sent to live with another family, neighbors or um, other people in the community. In some cases, the children might have been apprenticed. Um, families that needed workers or that wanted to uh, train someone in a particular skill might have requested an apprentice. And a child might have been sent to an orphanage just for a period of time until one or the other of the parents um, could get back on their feet and reclaim the child. And we will see instances of this. As we said a minute ago, uh, the child was not separated in the legal sense from their family. Adoptions might have been done in secret. They definitely were not done within the court system. And the children might have gone to extended family members under an informal arrangement. In 1851, Massachusetts passed the first modern adoption legislation. This came along with the industrialization and the development of those charitable societies. The primary uh, consideration was for the safety and well being of the child. And it was also to protect the birth parents as well as the, the adoptive parents. The law required adoptive parents to have ability to bring up the child, both financially as well as emotionally and supportive. And it also determined that the family was fit and proper that such adoption should take effect. Some of that was about to change in 1917. Minnesota was the first state to pass a law that said that adoption records had to be confidential, that they would be sealed. Children would be issued new birth certificates with their adoptive parents' names recorded. And the um, original birth certificate was completely replaced and expunged. By 1929, all states had enacted some form of adoption statutes. And as late as the 1950s, laws protecting the anonymity of the birth parents had been adopted in virtually all of the states. So by 1960, uh, closed adoptions were the most prevalent um, around. Concepts about which children and which families um, were involved in the adoption process did become, begin to change. In the 19th century, older children were the ones that were adopted um, frequently um, because of the infant mortality rate, um, infants uh, were not so much the prevalent adoptees, but by the early 20th century, infants were the more desirable um, for adoption. And the um, social custom believed that an infant could attach themselves to the family and there would be more bonding so that it would be beneficial for both the parents and the child and their relationship. So we see up until the 1970s, um, for the most part in the um, mid um, 1900s, only babies are being adopted and only married couples who could not produce children of their own biologically 
were allowed to be adoptive parents. And adoption actually peaked in the 1970s. But by the 1980s, concepts were beginning to be re-examined. For example, um, only uh, white parents could originally adopt a white child. If a child was of a um, particular race or ethnicity, they had to be adopted by matching parents of the same race or ethnicity. Um, so we're beginning to see in the 1980s some changes in that regard. Also, handicapped children early on were prevented from being um, adopted. In many cases, they were institutionalized for most of their lives. As late as 1998, Oregon was the first one to allow adult adoptees to access their original birth certificates. Today, we see approximately 135,000 children adopted each year. Many of these adoptions now are international adoptions as well as domestic adoptions. And 95% of adoptions do have some degree of openness or contact between the families. And it surprises me that still as late as the 21st century, only nine states have completely unrestricted access to adoption records, Colorado being one of those states. All the other states have some form of restriction, and it depends on the individual state and the statutes within that state as to how closed or restricted those adoption records are. It may actually take a court order in order to um, find out the information in some of those states. So let's take a look at some of the records that might exist. We do have the New York Foundling Home, which was established in 1869, and they were designed to receive and care for unwanted children. In the first month that it operated, 46 babies were placed with the New York Foundling Home. The following month, they had so many children they had to open a boarding department and place children with neighbors in the neighborhood. The New York Foundling Home records are available on Ancestry. And we will take a look at a couple of those. Um, there was also a movement um, primarily through the Roman Catholic Church um, from 1875 up to 1910, they were called mercy trains. And infants and toddler, toddlers by prearranged um, conditions were sent to Roman Catholic homes. Don't confuse the mercy trains with the orphan trains. They are two different movements. Um, here is a picture of uh, the receiving crib at the New York Foundling Home, probably from that late 1886 time frame. Census records may give us a clue um, about where to look for some of the records. Here is a listing from the 1910 census from the New York Foundling Home. To be perfectly honest with you, most of the records that I have found that have um, either asylums or orphanages have been in the 1910 census. I assume, and this may be incorrect, that some of these institutions were also enumerated earlier on or in later years but I have found them most significantly in the 1910 census. 
Um, in this particular one, um, I looked at Lucy Goodman and she is an infant. She's only six months, I think it's five months old um, in this 1910 census and she is in the foundling home. The records that are on Ancestry are the simple listing of very much the same uh, information as the census. We have Lucy Goodman again, and she is six months old. She's listed as an inmate. But what would be interesting in your family genealogy is, was there someone that worked in one of these homes? Because these people are also enumerated with their jobs and responsibilities um, within the foundling home. I was able to find an actual birth record for Lucy, and it shows that she is the illegitimate child of Sam Seinhoff and Sadie Goodman, and that she was approximately six months old in that 1905 census. We mentioned a little bit about orphan trains. These were also a supervised welfare program where children, uh, young children and infants were sent from New York, Boston, major large Eastern cities to foster homes in the Midwest. The program operated between 1854 and 1929. Uh, so it's a little bit longer program than the Mercy Trains and approximately 200 children were relocated. The orphan train system was ended with the organization of formal foster care um, system um, requirements. And while many we've heard both positive and negative stories about the orphan trains, Many people have done a lot of research into members of their family or others that um, participated willingly or unwillingly in this program. Here is a newspaper article um, that talks about a John Scott, um, a noted character in the city of Indianapolis and he came to this place as an orphan from Randall Island, New York. And he was who took him in, the ex-county treasurer, Posey, and he was taught barbering. Unfortunately, John met with a not positive ending, but on the other end of the uh, spectrum, we see at the same time, Thomas Taylor was taken by the late Alonzo Blair as an the orphan train passed through the city and is now a prominent lawyer in New York City. Mr. Scott unfortunately took to drink and was given a pauper's burial. So we see both the positive and the negative, but look in newspapers to see if you can find information about orphans and orphan train. Several genealogy societies in the Midwest have also done a lot of research on orphan train members and participants and have published a lot of this information to share. In this particular case, this is from Indiana and we see that Regina and her birth name was Baldwin, but she was taken in by the Novaks. And this family history was provided by her daughter. And the following case was a John Butts. He became an Irwin. And it also listed he had three other siblings that were taken in by other family members. Um, so look for genealogy societies if you do have a member that might have been placed on an orphan train. Um, and see if you know um, where they wound up and if you can work backwards from there with this information. 
Maternity homes, the first one opened by the Salvation Army in 1886. And these were designed as a safe place um, for the mothers and their expect, expected children. Um, in many cases, um, early on, they just allowed the woman uh, to stay there, to complete her pregnancy, and place the baby um, up for adoption. Uh, but as the 20th century rolled on, uh, these provided education, um, job training, and other valuable skills for the unwed mother. And today there are over 400 homes throughout the US um, that form, perform this function. This is an example of the Florence Crittenden home. And there are Florence Crittenden homes pretty much throughout the United States. Florence was unfortunately a four-year-old child who died um, uh, from illness. And her father was so overwhelmed with grief that when he finally came to terms with the death of his daughter, he established these homes for the protection of babies and young children. Um, there is a Florence Crittenden home here in Colorado, as well as in most other states. And they have, oh, through the, through the decades, they have merged with other social societies for the protection of children. Hopefully these, this doesn't represent uh, the case of most um, orphanages or orphan asylums where multiple children are sharing um, a single bed, but it's at least a cute picture. And it does address um, the need um, and just the sheer numbers of uh, young people that are involved in this system. Adoption agencies um, came about as late as 1910. And with that 1917 Minnesota law that closed adoptions, um, it then became mandatory that home studies be conducted. Um, this law also um, established uh, the foundation for child welfare agencies and placement reports were conducted both before the placement of the child as well as after the place, replacement of the child. In the 1960s, um, adoption agencies began to look at the children that were in foster care and that might be available and waiting for adoption. And they coordinated with adoption agencies to put those children up for adoption. The 80% of adoptions were arranged by agencies during the 1970s. And this was the peak of the adoption period. So where do we look for some of these records and what are some of the clues that we might be able to find? If you see the letters AD before a son or a daughter in those censuses up until 1940, you might find that they are an adopted son or daughter. In some cases later on, the actual word adopted does appear. You have to ask yourself the question, is there a significant difference in age between the two youngest children in the family? In some cases, it might indicate an adoption. In other cases, it might indicate the death of the mother of one child and the remarriage of the father. So don't fall into a trap there. Um, it may just be a normal remarriage situation, but take a look at it. Is an older child suddenly appearing in the family? 
So in other words, was this older child um, orphaned at some point and taken in by other relatives? And uh, residences of residents, excuse me, of orphanages and adoption agencies, um, do they later appear in census records? Since we do our census research backwards, you might find that a child is in a family and in looking back, you might find them in an orphanage or listed with an adoption agency. So here is one of the examples from the 1910 census. And it's very hard to see, but we see that Anna is an adopted daughter. She's four years old. She was born in New York, but another clue is that her parentage is unknown. We also have another case of an adopted daughter who is nine years old. But in this particular case, it says she was born in Indiana and she is, it lists her father's birthplace and mother's birthplace as those of her adoptive parents. We're not 100% sure. She may indeed have been a child of parents that were both born in Germany not necessarily the adoptive. So, um, but it does specifically state that she is adopted. Then we have a little bit of confusion because we find that in the Irwin family um, in 1900, they have a daughter, Catherine, and she is listed as their daughter, born in May of 1875. So she's 25 years old at this point, and she is a widow. It shows that she was born in Massachusetts, but it also has crossed out information where her parents were originally born in Newfoundland, but now it has been changed to show Indiana, the birthplaces of her father and mother. So is she an adopted child? We also find later on or earlier um, that Charles and Chloe also have a daughter, Florette, who in 1880 is four years old. And she is listed as their daughter. And we find that Florette later on is born in October of 1875. So this is the 1900 census. So we couldn't have two children born between May and October of 1875. And as it does turn out, Catherine is indeed the adopted daughter where Florette is their natural child. So look at those conflicting sets of information if you find them in your family to see if you can't decipher which is the true and veritable situation. We also have listings of actual orphanages and orphan asylums. And in this particular case, um, this Anthony Tremblay he is a 12-year-old child born in New York, and his parents were also born um, each. Actually, they were born in Canada. It turns out, and we talked about orphans, Anthony was, uh, his father had died in approximately 1905. His mother had no means of support, so she put Anthony and his two brothers into an orphanage. She later remarried and brought the boys home to live in the family with her new husband. So as we mentioned earlier, just because a child is in an orphanage doesn't necessarily mean that they have lost both parents. 
We've seen this record for uh, Lucy Goodman earlier. Look at births and christening records and look for the difference in the names to see if perhaps the child is illegitimate or not. Every now and then you find a church record. And I realize that the handwriting is very difficult on this. So let me read. Born to Helen, and that is Baxter, in the village of Livingston on the 28th of December, 1805, and baptized on the 26th of February in 1807. And the child is also going to be named Helen Baxter. So the female child is going to be named after her mother. This child at the time of its baptism could not find a father. Her mother gave it to a Pacnian, which she said came up to her on the road from Edinburgh. Though the father was suspected to be nearer, um, the doors, I'm not sure, um, but a confession from the time it was born to this day could not be extorted from the mother. So we have no idea who the father is, and we get some of those negative comments in the baptism record. Also, when you find baptism records for your relatives, are parents listed? When it appears blank, we have an infant. This is as late as 1943. The child is being baptized in Alton, Illinois, but there are no ditto marks underneath and the name is different. So this child probably is an illegitimate child. In some cases, the baptism records will actually state that a child is the natural child of the mother. Court records are probably going to be um, some of the most important records that you might find as far as adoption is concerned. And here again, these records might be sealed and deemed confidential. Um, is there a will? that might um, show that a child is inheriting something um, and the child is not supposedly related to the family. Um, as we mentioned very early on, many children were put up for apprenticeships and we also need to look at guardianships to see who these children might be. Records might even mention a birth mother in terms of adoptions in court records, rather than looking under A for adoption, you might consider looking under I for in re, R E. And it means concerning. And the court um, indexes are open, whereas the records might be closed. Here we have an adoption record for William Zetender and his wife, Sophia. And they have a four-year-old ch female child, four years old, and they are petitioning to have her name changed to Bertha Zetender. And she was originally Bertha Hurt. So some of these records can be seen. If an adoption has been within the lifetime of your family members, ask those family members what they remember about the situation and um, if they know any further information um, about where the adoption occurred, where the child might have been born. There are both original and amended birth certificates, which do show the name changes. May be difficult to find, but they do exist. 
turning to adoption agency records. And as we've seen, newspapers frequently include adoption hearings and the information mentioned there. Juvenile court records are also another source of information. Um, and recently someone asked me about orphans courts. Um, orphans courts, uh, the title um, only exists in a couple of states to this day. And essentially the orphans courts were originally probate courts because a parent might have died leaving an orphan. Orphanage and uh, poor farm records are also a source of information. And in the 21st century, the key thing that most people are turning to is DNA testing. As I mentioned earlier, there are many genealogical societies that are doing work in this particular area. Um, in St. Joseph County, Indiana, this is a list of adoptions, the surname, the given name, and the parents, the adoptive parents um, names. And it gives you the box and case number and the year in which the child, the month and year in which the child was adopted. Um, and it tells you which court they might have been adopted in. So look for these kinds of records in the area in which you or your ancestor might have lived. Newspaper articles, as we saw for the change of name or um, in the case of a negative incident where a person has died, it gives a complete talking. Here is a case where a woman is jailed for um, whipping a child, and the boy is one of two that the porters got from the Colorado State Home for Dependent Children for adoption. Uh, the adoption process has not been completed, and we hope it didn't go through. Um, a simple uh, court statement um, in the matter of the adoption of Lillian Coons by William Jane and his wife, Mary. So we get an original birth name for this person. On ancestry, um, there are orphans home records. There are not very many adoption type records on ancestry, um, but here is an orphan home and we see that Edward Smith is currently 15 years old. He was born in 1876. By the time he was seven years old, he had been admitted to the orphan home. And now at the age of 15 in 1891, he's going to be released because he's going to be indentured to N.B. Milland. So these are the kinds of records that might uh, give you a clue and you might see name change or uh, it may stay the same. Here is another case from the same thing. We've got a Gertrude Smith and um, she's nine years old. She was admitted in February and she's going to be released only a few months later because she's being released to a family member, um, Mrs. M. E. Robinson. So some children did go to other relatives. We talked about poor farms and poor farms were um, a poor substitute for families. In many cases, um, poor farms were filled with adults. Um, so um, children, they did not want the children in the poor farms. Um, but this one is in Oregon and it is a child who has experienced cerebral meningitis and actually has um, uh, passed away. 
and is going to be buried by a relative. So this young child did have family. She did have a mother that was listed. Um, so um, not all the records have been lost. We talked about DNA testing. Um, for, the, for the most part, we are doing autosomal DNA tests. This happens to be a report from a Y DNA test, and it's from a fam family by the last name of Glass. And they do not know anything about their grandfather. He supposedly was a bastard child. And it turns out that from this, from the DNA results, in some ways, he is related to a whole bunch of people that are named Hawkins. So this is one of those cases where a new um, DNA group called cluster research um, is most valuable to find out where all those Hawkins live. Did they live in a group? Um, this is very early on. The grandfather was born in the late 1900s. So, so there is a significant time period that needs to be um, covered and filled in to determine how the Hawkins are related to the Glass family. Um, but DNA test results are some of the best ways to reunite family members. In most cases, when since we're doing genealogy research, we're not going to hire a pre private investigator. But if you do wind up um, in a state that has restricted um, rules and legislation, it might behoove you to find that private investigator and to employ them in looking. Um, I wouldn't turn to that as the first case, but I would consider it um, if you run up against a lot of uh, stumbling blocks. You may have to petition the court. Um, if the state is a closed adoption state, that is going to be the route that you're going to need to take. There are reunion, reunion uh, registries. There's adopt.com and registryadoption.com, and they allow um, people that have been adopted to look for their birth parents, as well as um, people who have given up children to connect. And we'll look at a couple of those. The adoption service provider. Um, was the adoption uh, through um, an agency um, or through the courts? What were um, the methods that the adoption occurred, and you might turn to those agencies to see if you can find the records in the state and locality. There are both the altered and original birth certificates, um, as well as hospital records. Hospital records are um, a difficult thing because uh, you might just look for, if you happen to know the hospital where your uh, relative or ancestor might have been born, um, you just need to look for all the children that were born on a specific date. Um, difficult, but not impossible. And another one of those agencies is Orphan Finder. So this is um, the start of adopted.com um, and you fill out a questionnaire, uh, several questions, um, and then they will attempt to uh, keep that information so that if anyone else from the other side um, is inquiring as well, they can match you up. And it can be another relative that um, is looking for the same information that you're looking for, but they will make every effort to uh, match you. 
Um, this happens to be um, an advertisement from the Gladney Center for Adoption. It's one of those um, very large adoption agencies that provides a home for unwed mothers and allows for the adoption of uh, children, um, gives you the guidelines for how to get. And lastly, it does have one of those situations for how to find birth parents or how to find the child that might have been adopted. The orphanfinder.com um, website is simply a listing um, by state of the various um, agencies and um, uh, systems that might exist that might have handled um, orphan records. And you go through and the ones that are underlined do have actual links to them so that you can see um, adoption information records. You will see that some of these are very early on. Um, others of them um, will just give you um, information about um, the actual orphanage rather than listings of any names um, that are involved. But um, there are extensive lists um, throughout the internet for you to actually start your research. And I think we've come to the end of our program today. So um, we will open it up to any questions at this point in time. Okay, Terry, we don't have any questions, but a couple of things that did come to mind when I was listening to your presentation is there's uh, a couple of reasons why people really want to know who their parents are. And, and one is an emotional. We see so many examples of this where a child, even though they're raised by loving parent, adopted parents, it's still important for them to know who their parents might be or why they were uh, available for adoption. So that's an emotional standpoint. Another reason why they may want to know is, as you mentioned, we're learning more about DNA and how certain health issues are um, part of your family lineage and understanding that maybe uh, you're uh, susceptible to heart problems or other type of things that DNA information can provide. Understanding one's family history also helps understanding ourselves and, and our, our health issues. So it's this whole thing is very important. I would, I would wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> so Jessica? Yeah, thank you, Terry. So much good stuff there, as always. Um, I was thinking the same thing, Dan. Um, you know, our, my family had done the DNA testing. It was kind of interesting to see some of the, uh, you know, some of the health indicators that came up. And then we can go, okay, this is something I need to be a little more cautious about or, or whatnot. Um, looking at sort of what you outlined for us with the records, it may be actually easier to find records on older, you know, older records, the more recent they started to get more and more stringent. Over exactly. The yeah, we've got that intuitive. We've got that time period between 1851 and 1917. Um, so yes. Yeah. And well, even looking at that time frame, you had mentioned the first orphanage in New Orleans in the 1700s. And as you said, that's really early on, but what kind of struck me too is then you had mentioned it wasn't until 1929 that all states had adopted some adoption um, statutes. And that seems late to me, to yep. 1929. And then, and then to even look at the 1970s, the limitations that were still there that only married couples who could not produce their own family. What, you know, why would that even be a limitation? Why couldn't that good family adopt more kids, um, I wonder. 
And then of course, uh, the limitations on mixed race families, you know, just, just in the 1970s. And then all the way up to what you mentioned currently, nine states um, with unrestricted access. And that must be really frustrating for someone trying to learn more about their own lineage. Yeah. Um, interesting. Well, thank you so much. Lots of good information and resources there. Uh, we're taking a break from genealogy in December, but we'll be back January 15th uh, to discuss probate records. So come back and join us. Thanks, everybody.